Tapoti. Okay, good morning, welcome again. It's really nice to be here. I you know, want to extend my thanks for uh, Tanisabo, Ajahn Nisabo now. Uh, I've known him for Tan Nisabo for such a long time. I'll have to change my change my uh, uh, qualifier for him. <laughs> so, and everybody here at the Clear Mountain community, um, it's very, very inspiring to see so many people here. I was, came in this morning and I was overwhelmed how many people just came in together and knew what to do and, uh, you know, grab this, grab that, set this up, set that up. It was really, really inspiring to see uh, uh, a community growing out of, of, of uh, uh, Ajahn Nisabo here. And it sort of begs the question is, like, well, well, why am I here if Ajahn Nisabo is doing so well? What's, you know, what sort of brought me from Australia all the way to this, to this rainy, rainy part of the world? And I, I like the rain, by the way. It's, it's pretty good. So I, I, I had these sort of stereotypes of what Seattle is, and I got the stereotype. So I'm, pretty, I'm actually pretty happy about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. So it does beg the question of, you know, why am I actually here? Um, one, one reason is that uh, Janisabo is leading a pilgrimage to Thailand and he's leading a pilgrimage to India. And so he needs a, he needs a stand in and I'm more than happy to do that. But, you know, I've been, I've been invited to many places throughout the course of my monastic career. And my, my answer is usually, nah. Right? Couldn't be bothered. <laughs> I don't want to go anywhere. Um, so why did I say yes this time? Um, and one one reason is because again I've known Ajahn Nisabo for a long time, and the but I think the main reason that I'm here is I really really appreciate what Ajahn Nisabo is actually doing in trying to really develop a community and trying to develop a group of people that really have the same kind of goals, the same kind of intentions, and starting with that, starting with people, starting with a community of people, I think that's such a worthwhile thing to do. And I'm already seeing the results of that. I've met so many people within the course. I've been here for 40-something uh, 40, 40 hours now, and I've met way more people than 40, so... Uh, <laughs> I just keep meeting all these people. I'm going to forget most of your names, so I'm, I'm sorry in advance. But within the space of a year and a half now, you've been here? year and a half now. So uh, you can see this, uh, the community is, is, is quite large for uh, being only here a year and a half. So it's really encouraging to actually see that and to see uh, Jan Nisabo's uh, uh, desire to do this, to grow this kind of community. Um, to actually starting to come to fruition. So I think, I think that's very, very important for Buddhism as a whole. There's, you know, there's plenty of places out there in the world where you can practice Buddhism, but having a community of people that are practicing Buddhism, I think that this is probably one of the most important things. So developing this community and developing people around you, I think, I think this is the best way to go about setting up a Buddhist institution. So, in a way, that sort of brings me a little bit to what I wanted to talk about this morning, or what I think I'll talk about this morning, is actually posing the question, well, what actually is Buddhism? Does anybody have a decent answer for that? Does anyone have a roundabout answer for that? what Buddhism actually is? Yeah? It's a practice. It's a practice, yeah, very good, very good. Yeah? State of mind, yeah? 
way to not cling? Yeah? Yeah? Sorry? You know, Pete? Yeah? No. Pretty good. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one. You've done much better than me. I, 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 there's no way I could answer that in like a one sentence. I tend to overqualify too many things. So I think it's really great that you've, uh, that you've sort of, you have these, have these uh, uh, answers to this. But as we go around the room and we say this, you can see that there's, there's, a, different, there's a bit of a different answer there. You know, some of them are overli over, overlap a little bit, but there are some, there's some sort of differences there. So who gets to decide what Buddhism is? Is it the monks? Is it the nuns? Is it an institution? Is it a culture? Who really gets to actually decide what Buddhism is? And that's a, you know, that is a, you know, that's just as hard of a question as, you know, what Buddhism actually is. And so we can start to think, well, at least, well, well what is Buddhism not? You know, one thing it's not is, you know, it's maybe it's not an aesthetic. It, you know, it's probably not a kind of music. It's probably not a kind of art. Um, it's probably not mathematics. It's probably not... Uh, a military regime is probably not a political regime. There's, there's plenty of things that it's not. But what actually is it, though? You know, many people say, well, what, Buddhism, it's a, it's a science, it's a philosophy, it's a way of life, it's a, it's a state of mind, it's the it's way to end suffering. So there's so many ways that you can conceptualize what Buddhism is. So, you know, I think at the heart of it, at least for me, um, I'd say probably the necessary kind of conditions for what Buddhism is, is that it's a path towards liberation or a path to end suffering. That would be, that would seem to be like the necessary condition of what actually Buddhism is. Now, but there's many other things that it could be as well. You know, it could be, as I said, a philosophy, or it could be, you know, a, a, a form of metaphysics, it could be a form of logic, or it could be a form of epistemology. So we could say it's sort of like a philosophy in some way, but then you would probably have to expand that as well. It would have to be more of a living philosophy. It's a way of life, it's a way of practice. So you, could, you can even expand that as that it's, you know, it can be a kind of religious order as well. So these are some of the more, you would say, suffi sufficient conditions for what Buddhism might be. Buddhism, another sufficient condition might be that it is a moral system or an ethical system. Another sufficient condition could be that it is an education system or a training system in some way or a practice system. So, or, and I think one of the other conditions that it could be is a, as I was alluding to at the start, it's a communal system. It's a community of people and it's a way of social cohesion and it's a way to organize uh, uh, society in a particular kind of way. So these are some of the kind of sufficient conditions that we might have that it's a, that it's a, a, a kind of philosophy, it's a moral system, it's a uh, communal or a social system, it's a religious order, um, uh, and it's a system of training and a system of education. So these are the kind of sufficient conditions that we have, but also we have the necessary condition that it's a way to enlightenment. So if we have this necessary and sufficient conditions now, well, what do we do with this? What do we do with these necessary and sufficient conditions now? Well, this is where you come into it. You know, everybody's here, everyone's gathered here, there's so many people here. You're all here to learn something about the Dhamma and to contribute something and to build this kind of community here in Seattle. And I think this is very, very worthwhile. And so how do you do that? How do you actually uh, build something from the ground up? Again, Tan Nisabo's, Ajahn, Nisabo, Ajahn Nisabo is doing is doing such a good job of this. So. It, Already you have somebody that is, is, is guiding you in, in, a, in a very, very useful way by taking 
again, that necessary condition, that it's a path to liberation. But the sufficient conditions, this is sort of permeable and this is changeable. One thing that I'm really quite interested in is how Buddhism's changed over the millennia, how Buddhism's moved to different countries, how it's moved into different cultures, how it's moved to different points in history and how it's actually changed throughout time. So if we look at the history of Buddhism and we look at how it's changed over time, we can actually see that it has changed quite a lot. So it's really hard to pin down anything and go, well, that is Buddhism. Or well, this is Buddhism. Or well, that's Buddhism. What happens is, is Buddhism moves to a particular kind of area. And this is, this is sort of uniform across history. Buddhism moves to a particular kind of area and the people that take it there, they have this idea of, well, this is the central thing about Buddhism that we're going to take and we're going to spread out to others. And they take it to this particular area and what they do, it's sort of they integrate it into the local customs and the local uh, traditions and something moves and morphs and changes from that. And so this has happened throughout history and usually what happens after Buddhism has been in a particular place for a particular period of time, the people in that area think this is what Buddhism is. But what they've done is they've taken something that they think is the core, is the necessary conditions, and they've taken that and they've built a lot of the sufficient conditions on top of that, and they've made something that's their own. And so I think this is a, uh, many people might think, well, maybe that's not the, great, the greatest way to go about things. Things change, things move, you're maybe changing something about the Buddhist teachings. But I actually, for myself, I actually think this is a, this is a great thing. This is something really useful and really helpful. Buddhism wouldn't have survived up until this point if this hadn't have happened, if it hadn't been able to adapt, if it hadn't been able to meld into a new point in history and or, or a new culture or a new kind of belief system. This constant updating of what Buddhism has now become has been very, very useful. There's been if you look at something of way, for example, of why the Abhidharma was, uh, uh, was created, it was, uh, a lot of it was created in response to some of the Brahmin priests and the Hindu priests that had uh, brought up issues with it. So they had to adapt and, and add new things to, uh, to, to answer some of the queries that, that came up. So I think this is a very, very useful thing. And so but what usually, as I, said, as I said before, what usually happens is after something's been established in a particular area for a, particular, for a point of time, we start to go, well, this is what Buddhism is. And something new comes in, and it's like, no, nah, that's not Buddhism, no, nah, that's, that's, well, that's wrong, that's, that's just totally wrong view. But not realizing that we've been sort of, we've been beholden to this tradition of something coming in, the core teachings coming in, something changing from that. And so what does that mean for us now? What this sort of means is, you know, Ajahn Nisabo has come here and he has this idea, I have the core conditions of what I think Buddhism is and I'm bringing it into this community and I'm bringing it into this group of people and let's see what we can make from this. Let's see what we can build from this. Let's see what we can how we can progress Buddhism. And I think this is a very laudable thing to actually do. I mean, it's a part of the tradition of Buddhism, what has become the tradition and what has become the history of Buddhism. I think this is such a worthwhile thing to do, but it carries a huge weight with it. It's a massive weight. What that weight is is what Buddhism becomes. And you're now a part of that. Nisabo has brought that into your life now. So Nisabo has like thrown that on you. <laughs> He's dumped that in your lap and gone, okay, let's see what Buddhism becomes. So while this can be, if you really think about it, it's pretty daunting. And I've thought, like, I've spent, like, many, many years, uh, and, and Ajahn Nisabha probably uh, can attest to this, you're a junior monk for a long time, it's like, 
you know, there's all these like great senior monks and as Ajahn Nisabo said, I spent a lot of time with a lot of these monks and it's like, okay, it's in safe hands. But it's, next up is me. It's like, I, I don't know how to do this. I, I, don't, I have no idea. I don't know what, I'm, I can't even like look after myself. How am I going to look after a tradition and, and, a, and, a, and a whole religious order? How am I going to do that? That's insane. I can't do that. I can't even look after one or two guys in the monastery. It's, it's so, I think we all have that kind of daunting, daunting uh, realization when we actually think of this is actually that Buddhism is actually in our hands. You know, we are the ones that actually make Buddhism what it will become. And so, while this can be daunting, I think it's, it's actually such a unique and such a precious opportunity as well. And it's something that we can, if we practice the Dhamma within our hearts, it actually becomes a lot easier to do this out in the real world or in the physical world. If you practice the Dhamma within your heart, it starts to arise and then you start to know, well, what I should take out into the world. We know we have this necessary condition within our heart of like that this is a path to liberation, this is a path towards the ending of suffering. And we know some of the sufficient conditions that are there, that it's a moral system, that it's an educational system, that it's a religious system, that it's a, there's a communal and social system. We know these things, but as if we practice the Dhamma within our heart, it makes it easier for us to actually fill out these sufficient conditions. So I think I'll probably end up with this, and, but just by saying that I think Ajahn Nisabo is actually doing a very, very good job of this, and also uh, Ajahn Kovilo as well, doing a fantastic job of, of building this uh, and bringing it into the world in this kind of way. And I think if with the guidance of those two and, and also many of the people that I've met here over the, last, over the last two days, I'm pretty confident that Buddhism is in pretty safe hands with, with all of you. So with that, I'll probably uh, call, it, call it a day and maybe, and I don't know what happens next, so I'll, I'll pass back over to Ajahn Nisabo. I hope you all sort of got time to sit with each other a little. Um, so feel free to sort of speak to what came up. And you can also use this chance to ask questions. We have Ajahn Satoro here as well. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Hiram. Uh, our group uh, actually uh, introduced each other and uh, talked about how we got introduced to Buddhism. And then um, it kind of morphed in a way of how um, Buddhism and our practice has worked, you know, how our meditation and our practice has worked. And then um, what did come out was, uh, I think everyone had a common goal of um, how, how our meditation should be applied to all day. Like if you were washing dishes, that's your meditation at the moment, that's your focus. Uh, if you're doing laundry, if you're, um, you're communal, if you're being social, that is your meditation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what keeps you, your practice going as a routine. Um, I remember you had mentioned that uh, uh, two years ago at the park, uh, someone had, men had asked you, um, how, do you, how do you perfect your meditation? And you mentioned that, mm -hmm. um, how focus your meditation on what you're doing your everyday things, and that would keep you in a routine. Thank you. Thank you. We had an interesting theme. Oh, in, hold up. Oh, there's some, I forgot. Is there a weird place not to touch? I think it won't scream at us. It's, it's no stopped. Screaming. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think what was an interesting theme in ours was the, um, for many of us, of us the, the ending of arguments or, or arguing with people over things, not arguments like in our, you know, but, but then retaining those in our heads that, that we didn't engage in these in our lives, but we have not completely changed that practice internally, so we still are running through the arguments in our heads while we aren't participating in them uh, out 
in um, interpersonal interactions, kind of. So, any tips on ways to stop that one? I, 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 that, you're the you're <laughs> monk. <laughs> I'm waiting on you. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Suze. I'll continue Matt's theme on arguing, but what came up for me is this new intention to not argue with what life is giving me. Um, not making the new manifestations of aging into a problem that has to be fixed. I haven't gone very far beyond that. I'm just taking some baby steps. But that whole idea of not arguing with what is just coming my way, it feels huge. Reminds and I me. would love to hear any response. Ajahn? <laughs> um, we can bring one up for you, too. Um, it reminds me of what Ayananda Bodhi said. Uh, here's a, it's like from some a documentary she'd heard where she said, here's another cold, hard fact coming straight at you from reality. <laughs> and yeah, I think that non-contention is, is huge. And uh, the sense of seeing how these things arise and can be used as stepping stones in our practices, that's the essential um, shift of the first noble truth is turning towards that. And yeah, easier said than done, but it's, it's wonderful to hear it brought up in that language. Ajahn? Can you uh, bring over the mic to him? It's kind of hard to move this one, actually. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's such a nice reflection about arguing and uh, you know, sort of not arguing with reality. Um, you know, you argue with reality and you lose. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how good your arguments are, you're always going to lose. And so, I think you know there's something there's something beautiful in that uh, beautiful kind of surrender, in that, and that knowing that you that you don't have to be right and you don't have to win this argument, you don't have to uh, you don't have to be the victor at the end of it and stand on your high horse of like, I've 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 conquered I've conquered this argument. Uh, I, there's something really nice about actually sort of surrendering to that and go well I don't have to win this argument. I can just be with it. I can just be with reality. It's such a, such a, such a nice way to be in the world. And I guess to, to your sort of uh, reflection about, you know, you still constantly replaying the argument over in your head. And, you know, we can, we can just, we can continue to do that with reality as well. You know, we can just continue to fight against it. But then there's the more mundane aspect of you know, there's the people around us that we continue to argue with, and you say, "Well, you, the monk, you give us the answers." Like we monks, we like we argue as well. So, <laughs> you haven't argued yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yet, <laughs> yet. <laughs> but it's there's this there's this uh, nice aspect of well, you know, problems. The reason you would argue is because there's some kind of problem. So problems are a part of existence. So it's really about well, how do you how do you argue correctly? How do you argue with compassion? How do you argue with kindness? You know, do you, do you argue in a way where it's vitriolic and it's filled with greed, hatred, and delusion? Or, or do you argue with people because you're trying to reset something about reality and do that with kindness and compassion towards another, the other person that you're arguing with? And most of the time, at least, and I've fallen into the, the former category, plenty of times, arguing just because I'm angry. Um, but, and those, those are the ones that sort of stick, and that like stick there and eat at you and gnaw away. But the arguments you have out of compassion and out of care and out of kindness for others, they're the ones that you can let go. They're the ones that don't eat at you later in, yeah, throughout the rest of your life. So if you can argue, if you can argue with existence with kindness, then it's okay. You can argue, I'm going to lose, but it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> argue with people with kindness, it's fine. You're trying, to, you're trying to improve something about them and you can let that go. Yeah, let's go to the Zoom for the next three. Uh, uh, 
Uh, Joseph, you can unmute. Oh, I, uh, hi, I uh, asked a question in the chat. I'll just reread it. Um, if one recognizes panic as a cause for angry outbursts, how should one adjust their practice with that realization? I think this is um, in the Zoom session last Wednesday, we had someone bring up some really difficult situation in their apartment building with um, a lot of crime and just the pain that that was bringing up and sort of the looking again and again, and again out of the drapes and all this. And um, it really brought up the reflection for me about the Buddha's way he spoke about working with fear, which is he said when he was in the jungle um, or the forest practicing and fear arose, he made the determination to not change his posture until the fear had dissipated. So if he was walking, he would continue to walk meditation until it had gone. He wouldn't act on the fear even in a small change of posture. And I think um, when, you know, first of all, conceptualizing even the mundane, quote unquote, panic and fear that comes up in daily life um, as a really powerful source of teaching and to recollect that the Kruba Ajans, the great teachers of Thailand would travel months to find conditions where they would be afraid, you know, of like facing down tigers and elephants. And I think we all have tigers and elephants in our lives of different ki kinds. So really recognizing that if you can kind of be there and not react, um, there's a lot to be learned. Just like with anger, you know, there's a difference between suppression and repression. And in Buddhism, we're all about suppression. Like we don't express externally the fear or the anger ever. Um, and that's like what Ajahn Satoru was saying around, like if you can just let go of the argument, even though it might really rise up, if you don't act, then it's not something you regret for the rest of your life. Um, repression is where you don't acknowledge it. So we acknowledge and we work with it. But I think with panic, really, you know, not um, strengthening it by reacting um, and trying to sit with it as you can. Um, and if it's really difficult to do that, then, um, you know, placing awareness in the parts of your body that aren't panicked, like your elbows, your knees, your elbows are rarely panicked. So um, I think that can be helpful. And the final one is going and surrendering it to the Buddha. Um, if that requires bowing or prostrating a bit just to get the physical embodiment of that expression into, into your life. So I, I think that can help as well. Ajahn. Um. Okay, um, we can go for the next uh, Zoom participant. Holly. Uh, our group kind of wound up having a little bit of a theme about softening. So I just thought I'd share that. Uh, one person was kind of surprised at how her patience had increased and, and her... Um, uh, she was that most things were small things. Another person had greater, smaller, less restlessness and a more open heart. Uh, another person felt softer and greater happiness, and another person felt um, a greater sense of their Buddhist community. So there was this kind of settling and softening, uh, and not trying to grasp something or push it away, but really. I don't know. It was just kind of a nice uh, theme for the four of us, I thought, and I thought I'd share that. That's really nice. That's it's a, it's a good indication something's working if you're softening. Um, yeah, it's a, a, I think it's a part of the, the litmus test of how, how much your heart is inclining towards the Dharma if it is actually starting to soften. If it's getting harder and harder, then you're probably going in the wrong direction. So you're going in the right direction. That's a good thing. Was There was another question. Mary, Mary's next. you got good eyes. I can't read that far. Okay. Hello. Hello, Ajans and Sangha. Um, I just wanted to respond to the woman who was learning to not argue with aging. And I just wanted to recommend a beautiful talk by Ananda Bodhi on the unbeautiful, it's on Dharma Seed. And um, 
she asks the question, when is a rose perfect? And then proceeds to look at human life in that terms. And I found it very helpful with this question, and I hope you do too. Checking, okay. So um, I think we might wrap things up actually, and I appreciate everyone being willing to speak with one another and actually talk a bit. And um, I see we also have Eldon joining us. Hello, <laughs> it's the little one. So we're gonna uh, finish up today by, <laughs> by uh, if people want to, yeah, wave that way. <laughs>